When I was little, my family friend and attorney, Walter Cavanaugh, came to my childhood home. He had a briefcase full of big pens and pencils. I was so impressed. All I had was crayons. I told my mother that I wanted to be a lawyer too. Well, at this age, these things are fleeting. And later that evening when she had dinner company and invited all of her friends over to tell them that I had made my career choice, the poor woman didn't know the garbage truck had passed by that morning. If you could hang on the back of a truck and not get yelled at, how cool is that? She soon learned not to ask me anymore what my career choices would be. Today I'm going to take you on my personal journey and share with you what has inspired my passion in life's work. President Kennedy said once, one person can make a difference and everyone should try. That has resonated with me throughout my life. To want to make a difference, to want to volunteer, to want to go out and help others. Many of you may say, I'm so busy, do I really have the time for this? And what will I do? Will it really make an impact? And I'm here to share with you that one person can make a difference and why you should take this journey with me today. <clears throat> I travel to third world countries, places that have never seen the internet, TV. I want to take you away from your neighborhoods, from your computer and your comfort. Take you to worlds that don't have access to clean water or safe food to eat. I take, I take students with me to villages that have never seen a doctor for the, ever in the history of their village. We travel to give care and comfort to others. Sometimes, my clinics are made right where I'm standing, in the middle of nowhere. In 2007, I took college students with me from Global Medical Brigades. We went to a Central American country called Honduras. And we set up clinics, and we'd go from village to village, greeting people, being celebrated. We were the first medical care they ever had. One evening, <clears throat> outside my hut, people of villages had come. A woman was injured. She had a terrible machete wound. And life was running out of her. They couldn't do anything to stop this. My son, who's now a doctor at the Cleveland Clinic, James, helped me and guided with students holding flashlights over us. In the darkness of the night, the sounds of the jungle around us, we were able to close that wound and save her life and cheat death one more time. In 2010, a horrible earthquake hit the poor country, Haiti, one of the poorest nations in the Western Hemisphere. My daughter Alexis and I traveled there with a group called Heart to Heart from Kansas. We walked tirelessly, walking among the dead and the broken. The UN had come and sent troops to protect us. All the prisons had collapsed. Within five minutes, a third of their government was lost. We worked tirelessly and went back a second time. My wife, Irene, a nurse came and helped mentor students that would help work with me and run the medical clinics I worked. We fixed broken bones without x-rays. We did surgeries in the balcony of a church on the only building that was standing on that block. One day, a young woman and a family came and spoke to my wife and asked if we could help her. Her daughter had a curse. I had taken care of all kinds of injuries. I've never taken care of a curse. They believe in voodoo, and this young woman was born with a birth defect. And because of this, she could never go to school. She should not be allowed to be out with others. She lived in the shadows. With careful planning, I was able to restore her ear. And now this woman can have a life. Start now. Because of this earthquake, she met an American doctor that she would never have access to before. Every April 1st, my wife does an April Fool's joke on me. These jokes are epic. <clears throat> this year, she decided to have my family come Sunday for April 1st dinner. And we were food shopping the day before. And she insisted on buying a lottery ticket. Now, I didn't know that she was using yesterday's numbers. So when we had dinner that night, she had a ticket and a newspaper that matched. Well, she tells everybody at the dinner table, somebody on the block won a lottery. She said, but we don't buy those tickets. And I said, no, we bought that ticket just the other day. She said, I'll call the lottery office and I'll see if we won. I said, no, 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 check the newspaper. I got to think of everything. <laughs> well, of course, the hook was set. She reeled us in. We thought we had won the lottery. And again, she got me, April Fool's. In 2013, Patch Adams called me. It was April 1st. Patch Adams is a compassionate doctor who gives free medical care and tries to cheer up people dressed as a clown around the world, going to disasters to help people in their darkest moments. And he called me and asked me if I go with him to Russia. Well, after I hung up on him the first time, nice try, buddy. He called me back and convinced me that we had met before. In 2007, he gave a lecture talking about his passion 
his mission in life to start a free hospital called the Gesundheit Institute in West Virginia. Robert Williams did the movie, Patch Adams, in 1998. And Patch was going to Russia to children's orphanages. President Putin had closed adoptions to the world that year. And he wanted to go to cheer the children in the orphanages and visit the cancer hospitals dressed as clowns to cheer up the children. I had never been a clown. I wasn't sure I was going to be up for this. So I didn't say yes right away. But Patch convinced me, saying the children really just needed a warm smile and a hug. And I said, I'll come. This is one of the hardest missions I've ever done. I had never been a clown before. But more importantly than that, I wasn't sleeping in a tent. I was in hotels. I wasn't eating on the ground. We were in restaurants. What was very painful was to go to the children's orphanages and see the children in the cancer hospitals and be with them. Well, my attempts to try and learn how to speak Russian were going poorly. I did some research, and I found out that psychologists sometimes use puppet therapy to help children, to connect with them in ways that children have been traumatized. I decided I'm going to make puppets. Now, all of you are probably wearing socks today. Very simple. If you take a sock and you put a few beady eyes on him and a fuzzy nose, you've now made a puppet. Now, I knew I couldn't be funny, but he could. So my plan was to make puppets for the children and play with them. And when we left, this would be their parting gift. I made about 400 sock puppets. I got my daughter Ashley and Alexis to help me make them, my mom, patients, students. When I got to the airport, my bag weighed so much, there was no way they were going to let it on the plane. But when they knew what I was carrying, they said, you passed. When we were done playing with the children, this would be their toy. When you're a child in an orphanage, you don't have a friend. You're alone. When I got to the orphanages, they were horrendous. The children would just sit there rocking, waiting for the day to end. There was not a picture on a wall, not a curtain in a window. When we came with the puppets dressed as clowns, we were a big hit. When I was in Africa, I took students with me from England and Canada with Global Medical Brigades. We went to a village in Sub-Saharan Africa, far away from any roads, and I really had not seen much of the 20th century. There I met the elders and the witch doctor, and I was given a special cloth called the Kenta to wear. And this is given from the tribe to show that I was accepted and was able to treat the people. I would wear this to help them. They had a big ceremony for us because we were the first doctors ever in their village. <clears throat> and during the ceremony, people kept coming over and tapping me on the head. And I asked my interpreter, why do people keep tapping me on the head? He said, well, it's good luck to touch you. I said, why? Is it because I'm the doctor? He said, no. It's because you have gray hair. He said, look around. Nobody here lives that long. We set up a little clinic in our village, in the center, and no one came. And I asked my interpreter again, why isn't anybody coming? He said, well, we have a witch doctor. What do we need this doctor for? But I told the students, be patient, someone will come. In the heat of the African sun, and it was hot, a young woman came holding a toddler in her hands. There's no calendars here, there's no ages, we don't know how old people were. But she said, can you help me? I can't wake my baby. So I examined this baby, and this is the sickest baby I've ever seen in my life. I said, this baby's comatose. I asked my interpreter, what are these marks on the face? And she said, the witch doctor marked this baby for death. It has a shaking disease. So I knew what that meant. This baby had malaria. It had been comatose for three days. I said, I can help this baby. I'm going to do more medicine. Things you've never seen before. Can you trust me? She didn't say yes right away. But she looked and she saw I had the kenta. She said, yes, I will trust you. So we gave the baby medicines and hydration. And the next day, that baby was alive. It was well. We all had tears of joy in our eyes. I was telling the students who were before complaining, I have no Facebook, I have no cell phone, no bars. I said, who doesn't think this mission wasn't worth it? You came all this distance to save a life. Yes, you can make a difference. But you don't have to travel around the world to do these things. <clears throat> Six years ago, I helped start, based on Patch Adams' ideal, of free medical care in Bedford-Stuyvesant. SUNY Downstate Medical School has college students, and we run a free clinic, mentored by senior physicians like myself. Over 10 years ago, I started opening my office on a Sunday. Although I work six days a week, I now work seven. And on Sunday, we have a free clinic for farm workers. And these are migrant workers who toil in the fields and vineyards and do the jobs that make New York run. It's been my privilege to help with these people. They have no voice, they have no help, no health care. My children come home on the weekends to help run my clinic. I have college and high school students run it to be interpreters, transporters, and the like. 
So many of my friends and physicians sometimes say to me, why do you do this? Why do you go so hard to give out free medical care to people who don't even know your name? Why do you travel? You can't make such a difference in the world. Why do you bother? And there's a story written by Lauren Isley that I'm reminded of. And it talks about a young man standing on the beach one morning. And the night before was a terrible storm. And in the distance, he sees an older man walking along the beach, every so often stooping down, picking up a starfish, dusting it off, and tossing it back into the ocean. And as he approached, the young man remarks to himself, he sees many collectors, seashells and rocks, but not one like this. And he asks the older man, what are you doing? He says, the starfish throw well. I can help them. The young man crossed his arms. He said, do you collect? He says, no, only of the living. The young man looks at him and says, I gave up collecting a long time ago. No, the, not the living, nor the dead. Only death is a successful collector. The older man smiled and looked back at him. He picked up another starfish and threw it over his head in the way, in the way out into the waves. As it disappeared, the water rushed up to their feet. The wind was blowing at their clothes. The young man looked at him and said, there are thousands of starfish along this beach. You can't possibly make a difference. The older man smiled and looked at him again as he picked up another starfish, tossed it back into the sea and said, I made a difference to that one. President Kennedy said before he died, one person can make a difference. Patch Adams lives his life knowing he's trying to make that difference. I have shared with you today that as one person, I have made that difference. Won't you come with me? And together we'll save one more life. Thank you.